Hello everyone, I'm Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue, and I'd like to welcome you to the sunny side of the farm. Well, good morning everyone, and this is Sonny here, Secretary Sonny. Welcome back to the sunny side of the farm. It's a podcast that helps you understand what we're doing here at the Department of Agriculture and what we hope to do and where we hope to go. And today, You've heard a lot of talk about the food supply chain. It's something that uh, consumers don't always think about, but I think now they're thinking more about it in these uncertain times. It's been on the minds of people all across the uh, nation. And the average American really, most times, doesn't know where they get their hams or pork loins from. They buy in the store where those lettuce or eggs come from. Uh, but there's a whole chain of people and industries that make up our very sophisticated food supply chain. And right now, it's more important than ever to make sure that it remains safe, secure, and fully working. Today, we're gonna to be starting at the beginning of that food supply chain. One of our producers, who's a hog producer, and then next we'll talk to a grocer to help paint the picture of the whole chain from farm to table, truly from the start to the finish. And we all know these are very challenging times, but we want to share, make sure that you all have the facts and know what's going on with your foods. First to talk about today is the beginning of the cycle in that food supply chain. David Herring from North Carolina has been a farmer with his two brothers since 1983. And David, thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's glad to be here. Well, as you might know, I love to eat your product. The grocery stores and restaurants don't know a lot about how it got there. You and your brothers, I think, began this operation in 1983. So why don't you take a little time and just tell us about your operation and what's involved? Mr. Secretary, we actually, my granddad and my dad have been in the pork business as long as I can remember. My brothers, Tommy and Mark, I started in the pork business in 1983. We were basically buying feeder pigs and growing them out on the ground and sell them at market weights. And uh, then we decided to build a sow farm. And our, today, since 1983, we, we TDM farms, Tommy, David, and Mark, produce about 700,000 market animals a year. And the way that process works is, it starts on a birthing farm or a farrowing farm that you have female animals that are inseminated or bred and they basically, the gestation period on those animals is three months, three weeks, and three days. So roughly 114, 15 days after they're bred, you have piglets that are birthed. And those piglets stay on that mama for roughly about three weeks. She nurses them and feeds them for about three weeks. And then those piglets are off to either a grow out facility or a nursery facility. Different operations do it different ways. At TDM Farms, we take the piglets from mama at three weeks of age, and they're taken directly to a grow-out facility or a fattening or finishing facility. And then that process takes about 160 or 170 days. So from birth to market, it's roughly about six months, uh, give or take a little uh, week or two. Some grow faster than others. So David, you and your brothers really have an integrated operation from the sows and uh, the birthing uh, to the uh, weaning the pigs and then feeding those dogs out, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Now, while, you know, we got to operations like cattle where we have pastures and things like that, when those market hogs get ready to go to market, you don't have any storage capacity. They've got to go. That's a just-in-time type of system going to the processor, right? That's correct, Mr. Secretary. We have basically have facilities that are designed and the whole system is almost like a carousel. And as pigs go to market, pigs come right in behind them. And we birth pigs every day, we sell pigs every day. So the, like you said, it's a just-in-time situation and there's not a lot of overcapacity as far as, there's there's nowhere to keep animals because there's always animals in the pipeline coming through. Can you explain to the average consumer again the integration of that chain, why backups or any link in that chain such as processing or packing plants get backed up, what that does on the farm? Basically when you decide to breed an animal to have piglets, about nine and a half to ten months later you have a piglet that's 
ready to go to market. And the whole system's designed to flow through that with no interruptions. So when we have interruptions like today with packing facilities because of COVID-19, we have packing facilities that are closed. Those animals that needed to sell yesterday may not have a place to go. And we don't have enough capacity within the system to hold those animals. So it's created tremendous problems. And typically, this again is a very synchronized system for supply and demand. So usually, prior to COVID nineteen, the market kind of told you based on different pricing where you put more pigs in or less pigs in. But there's still a, a six month lag time there, right? That's correct. So we can't turn it off and turn it on like a light switch. I mean, once the animals are bred, basically six months later they have piglets or four and a half months later they have piglets and uh it's mother nature you can't turn it on and turn it off sure and i know there's some fear obviously if these processing plants are not able to continue to process those hogs to the market for people to eat then there's a fear of euthanasia that would be a very sad occasion would it not but it would go against everything a pig farmer stands for our goal is to raise a healthy nutritious product and take care of our animals when a situation is created like today where their supply chain is backing up and we have nowhere to take our animals, the healthiest thing you could do in some cases is euthanize them, but it just, it's a terrible situation and we hope we don't get confronted with that situation. Not only would that be financially distressing, but it would be heart wrenching as well to watch, as you said, what your objective is to grow healthy, safe food for people and to have to destroy that would just be a heartache. It goes against everything we stand for as pork producers. We sure hope that doesn't have to happen, David. We hope we can keep these processes open. And again, the meat and the meat cases for people, certainly they depend on you. And I want to thank you today for your part in America, Feeding America. Uh, many times you all are taken for granted, as you know, and that's okay with you all. You keep at it. And we want to just thank you for doing what you do in the food supply chain and keeping us most wholesome, healthy, nutritious food supply in the world. And we hope you can continue doing that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We really appreciate what you do also. Well, now that we've heard from David Herring, our hog producer, uh, we're gonna talk to the end of the supply chain uh, next and uh, talk to a grocer. Uh, the CEO of Albertsons, and that's where most of us prior to this thought our food came from were grocery stores. But now I think we've got a better understanding of the whole supply chain and how it operates together in a very integrated, sophisticated, synchronized fashion, almost like a ballet, particularly in the pork industry. As David indicated, uh, when those hogs get ready to go to market, they've got to go somewhere. And the uh, link in the middle is the link that's been most challenged in this area, and that's the processing and packing side. They take the live animals and convert them into uh, uh, types of meat that uh, we can be consumed in our grocery stores, whether they do the ultimate packaging or send uh, cuts of meat into the grocery stores to be uh, uh, cut to your discretion and uh, packaged there. But they're a very important part of our supply chain, and like any chain, Every link of chain is important to connect to one another. And our packers and processors have done an amazing job in this time of period because uh, their workers have to work very close together. It's a, like a manufacturing line. They have to work side by side and they've done everything they could to keep their workers safe. But unfortunately, uh, we still have seen some outbreaks there that have caused some concern among our packers and we've had some packing plants close that have created some challenges in the supply chain. But thankfully, our president deployed the Defense Production Act. It's a, uh, an order through an executive order that uh, mandates that we keep these uh, processing plants open because he understands that the biggest challenge uh, in the food supply chain is that no link can be unbroken. And when none of us have the ability to really go to the farm and pick up a hog and bring it home and process it for our family to consume, so these packers and processors are very, very important. They've had some uh, terrific heroic men and women uh, in those packing plants, making sure that we do have continued food supply here in the United States. 
In the USDA, we also have men and women in our food safety inspection service that have been right there in those meat processing facilities. And all these folks are true heroes on the front line of making sure that our families can buy meat in the grocery store in the future. So I wanna just thank them. I wanna call attention to the fact that uh, we have a amazing uh, integrated chain here in the United States. And the good news is, it, based on the president's order, USDA working with the CDC as well as OSHA uh, will be helping these plants get back online as quickly as possible with the goal of protecting their workers, following those guidelines that CDC and OSHA have, and giving those workers confidence that they can be protected and not be exposed uh, unnecessarily uh, to COVID-19 in the workplace. Uh, the companies have been doing everything they could, and USDA, CDC, and OSHA is gonna continue to help uh, make sure that they are following the guidelines so our workers can be safe and those workers can do what they've done all along, help us to have a healthy, safe, nutritious, and affordable food supply for our families for the future. So as you can see, as we talk to uh, our CEO of Albertsons, we can uh, find out that this is a very amazing type of an efficient system that is created in the United States, the lowest food dollar consumption anywhere in the world. We're blessed in America and our consumption and our consumers to pay less, significantly less in the United States for our food supply than any other developed country in the world. These are the men and women that are make it work. Uh, David Herring, from the producer perspective, our packers and processors, and those small and large throughout our country, as well as Albertsons and many of their other colleagues in the retail chain that stock those stores and keep us checked out and keep us fed. So these are all, uh, it's a good story and it's gonna continue. You can rest assured, uh, you're gonna have the food that you need for your family. Thank you again for continuing our podcast on our food supply chain that's all important. As I indicated earlier, our motto at USDA is to do right and feed everyone, but frankly, we have major partners among our society that actually accomplish that. We just help to uh, provide the rules and regulations and the governing that helps them to do it in an orderly fashion. And today we are going to be talking to one of our suppliers at the end of the food supply chain, those that deal with customers uh, directly in the grocery business. And with us today, our guest is Vivek Skangaran. He is the CEO of Albertsons uh, under several brand names. Vivek, thank you for joining us today, and uh, it's good to have you with good us. Good morning, Secretary Berndu, and thank you for having me on this. You are an important part, obviously. In fact, you are the part, when people think about food, you're the part that most people think about where they come to uh, actually uh, purchase and acquire that food. That's right, Secretary. We have, uh, we're privileged to be in this position as you said, we have banners across the country, West Coast, East Coast, and in the middle of the country. And I have 270,000 people who go out there and make it happen every day. We're thankful to them, and we're, we feel privileged to be in this position to serve the country with, uh, with, with the food, essential service. Well, we consumers are privileged to have you there and all the people who uh, continue to work in light of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, we've mentioned several times before, we have many heroes in the food supply chain from those who grow the food, pack and process the food, and certainly your people who continue to deliver that, stock those stores, and even check out our consumers. So uh, we're grateful for you and your company. Uh, I think you're the second largest grocery retailer in the United States under several brand names. 270,000 associates, that's a, yes, amazing. Sir. But uh, thank you again, and I hope you'll just pass along I know you communicate to those associates from time to time, and I hope you'll give them our thanks from, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Americans who, uh, who are able to achieve the, uh, the food supply that we need daily for our families. I will, certainly, thank you. Uh, things have been different, no doubt. Uh, we've talked about our, our dual uh, uh, production, processing, and delivery mechanism uh, before for about uh, where half of our food consumption typically is outside of the home, you deal with the other half and the retail establishments where people come to the grocery store 
and acquire products to consume at home. So uh, we've had a misalignment there, and I know that uh, uh, it's affected you somewhat. Initially, as you recall, we had almost a disaster-like uh, response, a national hurricane response of, of uh, raiding the stores and ho hoarding food. That must have been a challenge for your uh, logistical system. That's right, uh, Secretary. You know, over the last 10 years, uh, the uh, people eating outside has grown steadily. And it was more than half. It just got to more than half over the last couple of years. And, and all that changed suddenly in March. And we're used to hurricanes. You know, we know in the retail business, there's a hurricane around Houston or a big snowstorm somewhere. And we're able to corral all the resources and move it to that one location and take care of it uh, pretty quickly. But what happened in March happened across the country and very sure. suddenly. And I think we saw people coming in and buying just about everything in the store because there was a lot of uncertainty on what was going to happen. We, and and but, so that was March. And I think in April, we're starting to see more of a pattern, a more regular pattern, because people don't have the restaurants open, they're eating at home, the kids are back from school, and you know what it's like to have three or four teenage kids at home eating, <laughs> eating everything you can buy. So I think people are getting into more of a routine. They're buying a lot more than before from uh, stores like ours, uh, but it's because they can't go out and eat at restaurants and we're seeing uh, that kind of volume coming in. And so I feel, you know, uh, there's a little more of a steadiness to it. Uh, and, and I hope it stays that way as we go forward. And, and so that people don't have to come in and buy too much. There's plenty of food for the first day to buy. Well, thanks to you and your colleagues who really surged during that period of time and helping to replenish those shelves gave people confidence there would be food for them that they didn't have to hoard that way. So that was a great effort on behalf of all of our retailers in order to give people that confidence. I think we have stabilized to a large degree. Yes. Maybe except in spot uh, shelves. I still don't quite understand the toilet paper issue, but that's still... That's seems exactly to... right. I, I still don't either. Though I do, I will tell you, I think there are, I think some of our habits have changed. So I can understand sanitizers. People are sanitizing a lot more. We're using a lot more soap. We're using a lot more paper towels. And so those things that I think are different good habits that we need at this time. Uh, but I don't, we, you're right. One of these days, we'll all have plenty of toilet paper in the stores and in our homes. Well, certainly, but uh, nonetheless, uh, from a logistical standpoint, you know, with the thousands of stores you have and all the associates yes. and the logistics of the supply chain in the retail space, uh, obviously we had a very synchronized, almost a ballet just in time between the processors and you all in a very sophisticated ordering system uh, technology-wise. I know that had to be uh, somewhat dislocated as well from a supply situation. How did you all handle that? I will tell you, I, I, I really credit the industry for coming together on this, Secretary. So we, we realized that the supply was not sufficient for the demand if we just focused on the retail supply chain. And so we started working very quickly with the distributors who primarily went to restaurants so that we can start diverting some of that product to us. It comes in different sizes. It, uh, sometimes you have to get the product set up in your retail system. But we have a lot of, uh, for example, for meat processing, we do a lot of it at the store too. We have people who trim chicken and they're just fantastic associates. And so we were able to get larger size packages into the stores and make it ready for a retail customer. And so it took us about a couple of weeks to get that in full sync, but it is, it is working. And I, I, it's really admirable how the industry came together and, and, and it was nimble. I have learned a lesson though. I think the lesson I've learned is that uh, you said uh, we were all operating in a just-in-time environment. It's the right thing for steady states. But when you operate in just-in-time and you have a tight supply chain, it doesn't allow you to accommodate situations like this. I think we should all reflect as an industry and think about how to build some redundancy as we go forward. Well, redundancy is good. Hopefully this will never happen again, but you all surge in a wonderful way in order to, to really meet the needs of your consumers and your customers in a, in a great fashion. And as an American, I want to say thank you because certainly from, a, from the Secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture, if we'd had uh, continuing bare shelves, you can imagine the panic that would have originated yes. uh, 
among our citizenry. So you all helped to resolve and to calm people and, and give them confidence that there would be food for their families. Thank you. Have you seen differences, patterns between urban and rural situations? I know you have stores in both kind of categories. Have you seen differences there? Not as much as you would think. Uh, I think what we're seeing in urban areas is a little more, a greater emphasis on e-commerce. So people want the product delivered. I mean, you have more density. So people want products delivered um, mm -hmm. or they drive up to the store and pick it up. Uh, we've seen a little more of e-commerce there. Uh, we've seen um, a little more frequency in shopping in urban, uh, typically, because your pantries are not as big. The nature of the demand through March and April has kind of followed in uh, both places. And, um, uh, and, and again, I continue to believe that we'll, it'll steady out uh, and we'll start seeing some reliable patterns of consumption so that there are no, no, no dramatic supply changes and shortages. Okay. Well, without divulging proprietary sales information, I would have to assume your demand since the restaurant consumption has been down I would assume your sales are up uh, during this period of time. Yes, sir. They're up significantly. Um, I've got an earnings call later this week, and I'll share more numbers at that time. But they are up uh, significantly. And uh, both on both on what we're seeing is there's people are coming less often to the stores, but they're buying more when they come to the store. I and I think that's the right pattern. If people came once a week to the store and bought enough for the week, I think we'll have a good steady supply chain. Once again, I want to congratulate you and I want to thank you and all of your colleagues. You mentioned earlier how the industry came together. It was not, uh, it was time for, uh, not a time for competition, but a time of uh, working together as Americans to uh, keep our people fed. And I feel like as an industry, you all in the retail sector of the grocery supply chain were just magnificent in your efforts. I want to thank you and Albertsons, but all of your colleagues and other stores and brands that did an amazing job in keeping our people fed, but also keeping them calm to understand that the supply chain was healthy and that uh, they could uh, continue to get their food where they always have been. Thank you, Secretary, and uh, thank you for your support. We appreciate you joining us today on our podcast, The Sunny Side of the Farm. It's talking about our food supply chain. Thank you, and I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this episode of The Sunny Side of the Farm, and I look forward to visiting you again next month. 